Hello, hi everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I couldn't make it in person for today, but I hope everyone had a wonderful lunch. Uh, may I check first whether I'm audible, um, whether everyone can hear properly? Yes, we can hear very well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So today I'm going to cover how 5G networks benefits from the advances we see in the cloud domains such as cloud native technologies and hybrid cloud technologies and how it relates to some of the key concepts of uh, 5G, such as uh, 5G network slicing, private 5G and uh, edge computing. So my name is uh, Min Bui. I am a telecommunication solution architect in the AWS uh, public sector team. I am based out of uh, Singapore and I work mainly with uh, government agencies across uh, the region for projects related to telecommunication. 5G, but also IoT, edge computing, and uh, smart cities. So why do we need the 5G in the first place? So uh, basically to address use cases or markets that couldn't be addressed with previous 3G and 4G technology. So it could be because of performances reasons or because of cost of deploying new networks. So there are three main categories that has been defined as needed to be addressed by industry verticals and operators. Uh, the first one is EMBB or enhanced uh, mobile broadband. Uh, second one is uh, CMTC or critical machine type uh, communication. And the third one is machine, uh, massive machine type communica communication or MMMTC also called uh, uh, IoT. And basically in each of those categories, there are some requirements that are simply beyond the capabilities of existing wireless networks. So be it having the need to transfer tens of gigabit uh, per second of downlink, or be it having single digit end-to-end -end latency with very high reliability and consistent connectivity, or having millions of connected devices who needs to have battery life of 10 years and more, even more than that, right? So these types of capabilities are to be addressed with 5G to open new market segments that were previously, let's say, untapped by operators and also their customers. So all those use cases have um, varying needs. Uh, so we can see this uh, quadrants with uh, two of the dimensions uh, considered here. So uh, the bandwidth requirements and the latency uh, requirements. And for example, you could have heavy media workloads, you know, camera feeds, live streaming, uh, huge data streams that would require very high throughput, uh, very large uh, or very broad coverage, but for relatively few number of devices, right? And on the other side of the spectrum, you could have um, uh, URLLC requirements or ultra reliable low latency communication requirements, uh, use cases which would require, let's say, moderate throughput, um, small coverage, but uh, on the other hand, very low latency requirements and very stringent SLA for service uh, resiliency and service availability uh, or uh, QoS. So um, you could also have use cases uh, where you would require a very high number of devices that will send very few traffic. <clears throat> so I'm thinking about IoT devices, for example, but where you would need, for example, very long battery life and a massive number of device uh, connected. So really, depending on the use cases, uh, your network will need to support very different traffic characteristics on the same uh, network. So 5G is addressing this with the concept of network sizing, which is basically an independent, isolated logical set of resources dedicated to really specific use cases or customers where you can customize SLAs, you know, service level agreement, or uh, your uh, quality of service according to the specific needs of your application. And that can be completely isolated from other traffic. So this is from a separation of concern perspective. So in the space of a few years, uh, we really went from really, you know, old school private data centers running proprietary software, uh, tightly coupled with purple purpose-built hardware in private data centers to really cloud-optimized application all running on containers, right? So this opens up many more options than before. So one of the, I mean, the first option would be to have the whole uh, telecom infrastructure, 5G telecom infrastructure that could be moving to the cloud, uh, whereby the whole 5G network 
is created directly in the cloud. So only the antennas would remain on site and connect to the radio access uh, network. So it can be um, you know, self-managed or fully managed services like in the case of AWS uh, private 5G. Or you could have also self-managed telco 5G networks running on the cloud or on smaller uh, footprint hardware on premise, right? So for example, here you can see a setup of 5G networks running on 5G uh, AWS, uh, so sorry, running on edge AWS infrastructure. For example, in this picture, you can see these are ruggedized device called AWS Noble Edge. And because of the small footprint and the ruggedized aspect of it, this could be a setup that makes private 5G networks deployable anywhere. Um, for example, in the mountains where there is no connectivity to deploy, uh, to deploy drones, for example, with computer vision at the edge, uh, but also you would be able to host your 5G telco network itself on this uh, infrastructure, right? So this is just an example of a movable, uh, transportable 5G networks. So this setup can fit and be transported out there in the field wherever you need a private 5G uh, network, even in remote location. So why does cloud native really matter to uh, telcos and telco networks? So, Really the traditional method of going digital comes, I would say, with a heavy lift in the form of planning or in the forms of infra resources, also in the form of capital investment and also configuration plus integration before you even get to the value of uh, developing the application or the service that really matters to your end uh, customer. So cloud native architecture really fully take advantage of the distributed uh, scalable and flexible nature of the public cloud to maximize your focus on writing basically your application and creating the business value and bringing your new ideas uh, to the market. So going cloud native means abstracting away many layers of infrastructure that would otherwise be required. So for example, uh, networks or, um, or servers or operating uh, systems uh, and etc. So allowing all of this to be defined in code. So essentially infrastructure as a code, right? And um, or basically all the, uh, the application developer or the service developer has to worry about is orchestration, orchestrating the infrastructure they may need via code, for example, and, uh, and, and managing the application code uh, it's itself. And that's really the value of uh, cloud native and um, uh, where we basically provide the infrastructure uh, to jumpstart the deployment of a network. And uh, also we provide a deep set of existing services to configure as uh, needed. So we are working with operators and partners and we provide the automation, orchestration and monetization of the network uh, in, uh, in uh, record time. So essentially cloud native allows uh, deploying new innovative services in minutes, uh, really, uh, not, uh, not even days, and using CICD or continuous integration and continuous development um, approach. Really on average, uh, we can see 80% reduction of CNF deployment uh, and updates since this is now like a continuous process when compared with traditional deployment models that most often require you know, six months to one year projects every year. Um, one of the other benefits is observability. So have really a unified view of your networks and your applications or so everything becomes really observable. Uh, cloud closed loop uh, automation. So not only have visibility and trigger alerts, but also take appropriate remediation actions uh, autom automatically. So for example, if you have um, congestion detected on certain services, you can trigger uh, the creation of new network slices, for example. So everything becomes uh, actionable. Uh, you also uh, have network slices, so the ag uh, agility to create new network slices for your business purposes or your uh, specific customers and uh, create these uh, network functions and stitch them together, which can be you know, a very complex task. Um, so when you have to stitch the radio and the core and the transport uh, layer uh, together. Uh, we also have hybrid cloud deployment. So bring your workload wherever you need it. So we be it in the uh, you know, regional cloud or on premise or at even the rugged disconnected edge or even at the edge of 5G, 5G telco networks. 
uh, edge analytics, we can run also analytics at the edge or in the uh, regional cloud. And also uh, the, those cloud native uh, services all allows you to run predictive automation to improve also operations. So we can run analytics to have a forecast or capacity planning or do preventive maintenance to detect and uh, remediate uh, incidents before they even uh, happen. So now just a word on the private uh, networks and private 5G networks. So basically a private uh, 5G network is having a telco network comprised of um, dedicated network functions for your enterprise or use cases. And instead of sharing this network uh, with the consumer market network infrastructure, uh, uh, which is used by your or my personal smartphone, you would have a dedicated basically uh, network to support your own uh, traffic. So you might have heard of uh, that uh, exciting new announcement at reInvent uh, about uh, this uh, AWS private 5G. So this is just an illustration of how 5G network can also benefit from cloud native capability. So basically with AWS private 5G, you can set up and scale a private mobile network in days really instead of months. So you get to deploy and enjoy mobile networks without the pain of long planning cycles or complex integration or high upfront costs, right? So I won't go too much into the details, but basically it is um, super easy to set up. So you tell us where you want to build your network and you can specify the network capacity you need to be it in terms of bandwidth or in terms of coverage, you know, what area you want to cover. And we ship you all the required uh, hardware, so the antennas, uh, the software, and even the, the SIM cards as well. So once the hardware on site is powered on, the AWS private 5G hardware will auto configure to set up a private mobile uh, network, right? And then you just have to pop in the SIM cards into your device and that's it. Everything is connected and you have your AWS private, uh, your private 5G network running uh, directly in the cloud, right? And if you want additional capacity or additional uh, devices, then you just do it from the AWS console as with any other um, AWS services. So uh, best of all, you can provision as many connected device and users as you want without any per device uh, charges as well. So now one of the concepts I'm going to talk about uh, is actually one of the drivers really of why 5G was created in the first place. So one of the challenges of the existing 4G network is that it is very much like a monolith, right? So all the services being supported on the same infrastructure and by the same telco networks with uh, only a few ways to provide differentiated QS, which are, you know, I would say not so flexible, meaning very much statically configured. So it makes it hard to fulfill a broad range of business requirements. We can have, we can have very different network characteristics, right? So how does 5G can meet uh, such different requirements, right? So the key concept really are access, which I say multi-access design, so supporting uh, not, not, not only obviously mobile and cellular access, of course, but also uh, Wi-Fi and fixed uh, network natively, right? So you can have your Wi-Fi and fixed network connected to 5G networks, uh, 5G core networks uh, directly. Uh, you will have a, a layer of virtualization, so uh, of network functions, so for fast deployment, flexibility, flexibility and scalability. You will have also a layer of transport and SDN, so to give programmability to networking, and be able to centralize and simplify the management of your network configuration. And you would have also distributed cloud and RAM, right? So to have the potential, the potential to distribute your capacity and deploy your VNF and your workload closer to the users instead of only in you know, central exchanges. So really network slicing is built upon those pillars and, uh, and to give a separate slice of network to address a variety of uh, uh, use cases. So, Ultimately, all those domains being stitched together by a common layer of um, uh, orchestration and analytics. So while 4G network were mostly designed for phones you know, with largely uh, you know, a one size fit all approach, 5G networks really are des designed for much more flexible use cases, um, addressing the needs for many special purpose networks. So you can see here, this is pretty much a one size fit all. So with, with all three use cases going through the same pipe or the same uh, packet data unit session, PDU sessions, right? So um, with network size, each size can be basically optimized for the characteristics that are needed for a specific services, 
without wasting resources on things it doesn't need. So you have more control on the service level agreement, more control on the QoS you want to uh, implement, uh, and you also have no or less resource contention between those uh, different types of traffic. And also, uh, most importantly, you can ensure the isolation of resources from traffic perspective. So uh, also uh, ensure the isolation of uh, resources from management and capacity perspective, right? So for example, here you can have different network slides for an EMBB uh, network slice. For example, if you have a Wi-Fi or uh, like a video uh, video uh, broadcast uh, types of uh, use case you want to implement. And here you would have a, a massive uh, a machine type communication use cases. Typically, if you have to connect uh, IoT sensors and here you would have another uh, ultra low latency or critical communication slice uh, that you can implement using network slice. So in the core network, it would typically look like this. So having a set of core functions dedicated to a specific network size for isolation of resources and providing tailored network characteristics to uh, that, uh, that use case. So that would be network slice one, network slice two, and network slice three that would be handled by different network and, and separated network uh, functions and dedicated uh, to that specific uh, use case or customers. So what does it mean on the transport part, right? So essentially the network slicing concept will not work if the underlying network is not able to cater for those network slices. So in other words, the transport layer must maintain the properties and SLAs of the 5G network slices. So from transport perspective, you need the mechanism to do that. So basically what you would need is some kind of dynamic resource partitioning. You don't want to be uh, the partition to be fully shared or to be the partitioning to be statically configured because this would uh, be uh, basically a waste of resources. So from right to left, um, in your IP packet, you would have packet identifier used for mapping the IP packets to transport resource partition, for example. So we would have packet marks by the telco core run network based on S and SSAI, for, which is basically a network slice identifier. And some of those QS values will be used to mark to map, sorry, the packet to transport resource uh, uh, partition uh, um, uh, traffic class, right? So, uh, and secondly, you would have isolation. So you would have a certain mapping of the packet into uh, transport resource uh, partitions that will be sent to uh, uh, VPNs, basically, right? So this is for the isolation. And for resource optimization, basically those VPNs will be transported in traffic engineering uh, tunnels, right? So within uh, that VPN, uh, you would also have uh, the capability to put uh, you know, uh, the packets into different traffic class uh, queues. So this is just an example of a mechanism that uh, could be used at the transport layer to support network sexing at the 5G uh, uh, for 5G. So now I want to talk a little bit also about edge, right? Uh, so of course, obviously you can do 5G without edge and you and vice versa, you, know, can, you can do five, uh, edge without 5G as well. But really the two concepts synergize quite well together. And, and this is how basically you provide ultra low latency over 5G in certain uh, use cases, in certain ultra URLC uh, uh, or ultra reliable low latency communication use cases as well. So enterprise and uh, really uh, government agencies are, are now adopting the cloud at a, rap, uh, you know, at a rapid pace to reduce cost, uh, become more agile, and also innovate uh, faster. Right? So um, I would say that while most workloads can be easily, easily migrated to the cloud, some workloads will remain on premises or at the edge due to some low latency or local data processing or data residency requirements. So some applications will need to be also re-architected or modernized before they can even be moved to the cloud. And this uh, traditionally also take time. So, uh, really before deciding on an edge architecture or another, we need to understand you know, the workloads that will be running on it and why edge is needed for those workloads in the first place. So application really have different needs. So most application can be easily migrated to the cloud, but some application cannot be moved to the cloud right away and some needs to remain on premise. So some of the reason why the application might need to reside, uh, to re reside on premise is, uh, is first of all, the first one is an emerging class of new application that require 
ultra low latency, such as uh, real time gaming or video streaming or uh, <clears throat> low latency AR VR or autonomous vehicles, et cetera, right? So these applications are deployed in on-premise data centers or branch offices or hospitals or factory floors or retail location and at the edge of, uh, you know, at the edge of some uh, cell tower sites, right? Um, a second trend I would say is uh, local uh, data processing. So customers are generating an enormous amount of data in their digital transformation initiatives and uh, an increasing implementation of IoT devices. So some of this data uh, needs to be processed uh, locally because simply because they can't be easily uh, mig migrated or transferred to the cloud due to, uh, to the sheer size or to the cost of uh, transferring those data to the cloud or to the lack of good uh, bandwidth you know between the sites or the and the cloud right or timing constraint as well right and the third trend is also uh, quite important is data residency so security and tax regulation and data sovereignty and changing geopolitical dynamics uh, can require customers to store data in specific countries states or you know cities right so when the cloud region is not available to address a customer data residency requirements, they have to maintain or deploy new IT infrastructure to support still those workloads. So if we represent this into a more, in a more pictorial way, you have application that can reside in the AWS region right? or, uh, or in certain on-premise uh, location or uh, office building and factories, for example, or in certain uh, big cities or closer to a telco data center, if, for example, you are planning to use mobile connectivity and require super low latency. Or it can also be at uh, the very deep uh, edge where basically your device are located. So for example, if you have IoT sensors, right? Or even at the rugged edge, uh, which is uh, or location that are without uh, proper cooling or power, for example, or with no connectivity such as on ship or in remote mining location. So for all those uh, use cases, customer wants to be able to support applications that have to remain uh, on premises using the same, still the same uh, services, the same APIs and tools as they would use in the normal cloud, right? So customers wants to have this continuum of consistent cloud services to wherever they need it to support uh, the, the business. And they, they would also need operational consistency meaning no change in the way you manage or deploy or do the lifecycle management, or no change in the code, whether you deploy in the region or whether you deploy uh, at the edge, manage it uh, the same way. Basically. So with AWS, basically you can distribute your cloud services to wherever the customer needs it, to on-premise uh, data centers, branch location, manufacturing plants, large metro uh, centers, and other remote location while keeping that same operation experience across edge infra and cloud. So same API, same CLI, same tools, etc. Right. So this is uh, when you combine all of this, uh, you have telco operators also building the whole 5G network on AWS. So uh, infrastructure using a combination of AWS outposts, local zone, and AWS region. So this is uh, the case, for example, for Dish Network, a telco operators in the US that deploys uh, open run and 5G core on AWS infrastructure be it in region or be it also on-premise. So receiving immediate benefits in terms of security, operational resilience and scalability um, and elasticity. All right, so key takeaway 5G redesign for custom, uh, consumer use case, but also for enterprise industry use cases, which requirement goes beyond the existing tech, right? Be it ultra reliable low latency, extreme throughput or network service APIs exposure. Cloud Native also expand the network capabilities in terms of portability, automation, uh, analytics. It also enables fast creation of 5G network slices. You can run also private 5G networks uh, on AWS as a self, uh, you know, a fully managed services or as a self-managed uh, 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 5G private networks running on uh, cloud infrastructure or on-premise infrastructure. Hybrid Edge and 5G MEC for low latency workloads goes very well with 5G as well for low latency uh, use cases. And uh, finally, transport domain must implement also efficient mechanism to enforce you know, the service level, level agreements and performance and traffic isolation uh, bus slide. So you need to have certain uh, mechanism to ensure the dynamic resource partitioning uh, such as QS, traffic class or queue uh, mechanism. 
All right, so this ends uh, my presentation. So um, thank you to uh, the BKNX team for, you know, for inviting me and thank you all for joining me today. Thank you very much. Um, anybody you. has question for Mr. Wu? Okay, maybe I have one quick question to, for you. Um, for the 5G cloud native, uh, which sector do you see will be the first to adopt this idea or uh, this tactic? Right, so I mean, uh, it's already uh, happening in a broad range of uh, industries. So uh, I would say all the, you know, let's say uh, all the industry are concerned, right? Um, so there have been some, a lot of uh, private 5G traction, first of all, in the defense, um, in the defense and uh, national security uh, sectors, where some of the sensitive, you know, uh, government agencies would like also to have their own private 5G networks uh, to manage their communication. But more and more, actually, we see it uh, also happening uh, in the broader enterprise uh, world, you know, where any enterprises uh, could adopt private 5G for uh, their communication. So one example would, would be, for example, uh, uh, enterprises such as ports, right? So in Singapore, we have big ports as well. Uh, big ports handling cargo ships, you know, one of the biggest ports in Asia. And for those types of customers that have a critical mass, it can make sense also for their um, for their uh, for their uh, use cases and for their services to have a private 5G networks to handle those types of automated guided vehicles use cases or to implement those sort of remote uh, control of um, uh, you know cranes and gantries etc. So um, it, it is also the case for uh, the um, uh, aerospatial uh, industry, for example, having some of the services running in airports running uh, 5G, right? And uh, another, uh, I would say, um, uh, sector where it's uh, also picking up quite a lot is also in the industry. So industry 4.0, where more and more of their uh, factories equipments would require either, you know, IoT connectivity, uh, and uh, so with a, a very wide range uh, or very right, uh, wide coverage with uh, increasingly uh, low latency requirements and reliability uh, requirements. So this is another uh, sector that we see also uh, uh, picking up and which has also a lot of potential, uh, the industry 4.0 as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, a big round of applause for Mr. Hui. Thank you. And for our second speaker, we have from NTT, Mr. Katsuhiro Oki. He will talk on the topic of edge computing, NTT offerings in Japan and use cases. Thank you. Okay, welcome.
สวัสดีครับผมชีคัตฮิโรอุกิอินดีทีไดลูแจ็คคลาวด์ so <laughs> thank you so much and thank you so much for the beginning people to invite me over to the Thailand as a speaker um, today I would like to talk about the edge computing and I would like to focus on the um, entity offering in Japan and some of the use cases we apply for the Japan market. Um, first of all, I would like to do the self introduction. My name is Katsuhiro Oki, I'm sales engineer for the one of the largest um, IP transit network services. Uh, we call it Jin, um, AS2914, owned by uh, NTT Limited. I have been working for these services for eight years, and I have been experiencing for the um, different roles, starting from customer engineer in Japan and went to the Hong Kong to do um, product management and do some um, business analytics and come back to Japan and do some um, capacity planning engineer for Japan. And now I'm doing the sales engineer for whole ASEAN region, including Thai, Indonesia, and Singapore and Malaysia. Although today's presentation is talking about edge computing, I'd like to begin this presentation with this analogy of the airport. This is the analogy to explain entities ultimate future and the services we were creating to realize customers digital transformation. There are two reasons why um, airport is important infrastructure for everyone. The first reason is the um, function as a hub. Um, the reason why we go to the Bangkok airport is not only because Bangkok airport itself, but we definitely have an ultimate destination. We would like to go like, for example, um, Tokyo or Osaka, Kyoto, Okinawa. Okinawa is my hometown um, and also the Hokkaido. Because we would like to go to such an ultimate destination, we go to the Bangkok airport and then transited to the um, Narita airport and then transited to the appropriate transportation like train or monorail or bus or taxi. The second reason why airport terminal is important for um, social awareness is because of, um, because the people, when every time we want to ah sorry the uh, we can receive any different types of the service whenever we demand at the airport like for example when we feel hungry we can eat mcdonald's at the airport or when we feel tired we can we can stay overnight at the hotel located inside of the hotel or we can take uh, some massage services at the airport or when we uh, when we were out of the cash uh, we can withdraw some money from the ATM machine, or when you forget to buy some Slovenia for your wife, then you can get the Slovenia at the airport so you don't get scolded from your wife. Um, and when we apply this analogy, the dead airport is the analogy for the data center and uh, load railway and airway and transportation infrastructure is the analogy for our network. And tenants is the client and um, third party business um, partner for us. And the passenger for this airplane is, of course, the data itself. That's our ultimate goal in the future and the services we were creating. And when we apply the airport terminal analogy to our services, this is, the, um, this is what we were creating. This is the ecosystem we were creating to realize customer's digital transformation. Like for example, we were building many different um, interconnecting, interconnecting points in our global data center. Um, and also we were creating the portal site and portal server for our customer to access any different APIs and apps. And we were also building the edge server this is for customer to select where they want to process the data at the edge or at the cloud, depending on the data type. And we were one of the very layer provider 
who have um, world class network for both open network and closed network, and IX and P5G. Um, we have such network. Um, these are the all the different component, and we were building we were building such an ecosystem combining all of the um, components together. And the purpose for us to create such an ecosystem is because we'd like to achieve the um, digital transformation for our customer. Edge computing is just one of the components for this ecosystem, but my presentation is going to be focused on the edge computing in detail from now on. So let me begin with the environment surrounding edge computing. What is the edge computing? 30 years ago, the mainstream for the um, IT architecture for everyone is on-premise. So customer needs to purchase um, their own server by themselves, and then they have to process their own data on their on-premise server. But with the development of the IT, the data amount we have to process every day is getting more and more and more. So that's why we have developed the cloud computing. And this is now the mainstream for everyone. Customer can now transfer all the data to the cloud computing cloud server. Um, and um, they can ask cloud player to process their own data at the cloud. And the mainstream for the cloud players is pay per use. So um, customer can um, request uh, cloud player to process the data and pay for it. However, now with the development of the IoT and artificial intelligence, the data amount we have to process every day is getting even more and the data amount is becoming enormous. And that's the reason why we were now focusing on the edge computing on the right hand side. With the edge computing, customer can now select where they want to process the data, at the edge or at the um, cloud, depending on the data type. So if the data require real-time processing, um, like, the, like the automatic um, camera um, send the edge server for the um, like video data, which is showing the kids running into your car, you want to process such data immediately to stop the car. So for this kind of the data, you can select to process it at the edge server nearer to the customer's devices. But if the data required intensive processing because of the complexity of the data, you can still select to process such data at the, um, at the cloud. So customer can now um, realize and achieve the um, data optimization. This slide is just to show you um, the reason why edge computing is getting more attention these days. Um, there are two reasons for it. The first one is the AI progress, and another one is the IoT development. With these technology development, the data amount we need to um, process every day is getting enormous, and that's why edge computing is getting more and more attention today. And this slide is to show you um, the edge market trend. The market trend for the edge computing is getting uh, rapidly um, growing. 27.2% annual growth up to 2030. And USD 32.8 billion by 2030. And the reason why this market is growing such rapidly is because of these three reasons on the left box. The first one is the data volume. So the data volume um, we have to process every day is keep um, increasing. And real-time processing demand is also um, um, increasing a lot these days because of like the example that I just explained to you for the automatic car. Um, and finally, the COVID-13 um, influence. With the COVID-13, um, more and more employees is now doing the working from the home. So the company have less possibility to guarantee um, secure, secure environment to protect 
customer's um, data. And this slide is to show you the challenges for the cloud and benefit for the um, edge computing. First challenges for the cloud is the latency. With the cloud computing, customer needs to um, transfer all the data from their location to the um, cloud. And especially when cloud um, players is located in a different site or different city or even different country, then it will cause delay. Another challenge for the cloud computing is the security risk because customer need to transfer all the data up to the um, cloud. They need to rely on the network and sometimes customer just use the internet or the open network to transfer their um, data to the cloud. So it will definitely cause the risk of the information leakage. And finally, the data growth. With the IoT and artificial intelligence development, the data amount we need to process every day is getting more and more. However, the edge computing can solve these challenges cloud hub, um, real-time processing. So with the edge, um, we can process customers' data nearer to the edge devices. So we can achieve real-time processing. And security risk mitigation, because we don't need to transfer customers' data to the cloud, and we don't need to rely on the network, we can also mitigate the security risk. And finally, the efficiency of the data um, data transmission. Um, when customer only relying on the cloud computing, customer needs to transfer all of the data to the cloud player, no matter what the data types is. So the mainstream of the cloud player um, for the payment scheme is the pay per use. So um, customer sometimes get supplies when they get bidding from the cloud player. But with the edge computing, customer now can choose um, where they want to process the data, at the edge or at the cloud, depending on the data type. So, um, and also our edge services, payment scheme is um, monthly fixed fee. So customer never gets supplies when they receive bidding from us. This slide is to show you the edge computing system architecture. Um, when we talk about the edge computing, we have several types of the edge computing technology. Um, the first one is network edge. We sometimes call it MEC or the DC edge. This is for the customer or the major provider to process enormous amount of the data at the edge. But today's presentation is focusing on the um, on-premise edge services. Our services is called SDPF Edge. Um, we deploy the hardware at the customer's on site and we process um, customer's data on, on premise on our server. Until now, I'm only talking about the benefit for the edge computing, but Edge computing is not the perfect solution or silver bullet for every different types of the challenges. Edge computing also have um, some, some of the challenges. First of all, um, initial deployment configuration is um, difficult, um, or it, especially for the non-tech types of the company like enterprise. And managing multiple edge terminals, when customer have a different site, many different sites, we need to deploy um, multiple edge terminal. So it may be difficult for the engineer to manage all of different um, terminals. And because of this, it sometimes may be difficult for the NOC team to troubleshoot and find it out the root cause because when we have multiple edge terminals, it means we have, a, we have more single point of the failure at your network. However, 
um, we can solve these challenges with SDPFH. SDPFH is our entity H um, services in Japan. This is the feature of the SDPFH. The A and B is just a general um, benefit for the edge computing, like a low latency for the data processing or network efficiency. Customer can achieve the um, optimization for the data processing. But from the C to E, this is the unique benefit customer can enjoy with SDPFH. The first one is the common hardware and software platform for the services. Um, so it is, it's going to be easier for the customer to manage um, multiple edge terminals. And fixed monthly fee for the hardware, even for the hardware maintenance, we can bundle um, these maintenance service all together on the single service order form. So customer can, a customer is not going to be surprised when they receive billing from um, us. And finally, and most importantly, um, full stack proposal from edge to the cloud. NTT is one of the unique provider who own the world-class data center as well as the network and also the um, cloud services all together. So we can um, combine and bundle all the different services into the single SOF. So um, that's the um, strong point for the NTT um, proposal to the customer. Until now, I talked about the, um, the basic of the edge computing and then, and then the, some of the um, edge services we provided in Japan. But from now on, I would like to um, explain some use cases and um, some use cases to show you what customer can really do with our edge services. So the first of all, this is the um, use case for the abnormal detection of automatic driving. Edge Sabo, our Edge Sabo received the video data from the camera deployed on the automatic car. And whenever we detect abnormal information from that data, we immediately take action um, and then like stop the car, for example. So we can achieve real-time data processing. And another example is the um, abnormal detection for the chemical plant. The chemical plant have several sensor like um, temperature sensor or pressure sensor or water leakage sensor. Um, so whenever we detect abnormal figure, um, we will take uh, immediate action to collect the figure. This is the another example of the wearable device solution. We call it Hitoe T-shirts. And these T-shirts have a sensor to detect um, heartbeat and to detect the degree of the tiredness. So one of the uh, customer, the transportation customer um, applied this solution and they, um, their driver for the long distance truck wear these T-shirts. So now we can detect um, which region they should be careful and which region they should raise the alert um, to, to, the, to the driver. And the blue dot is the, um, the place and region uh, driver may fall in sleep. So um, customer can take a necessary action to prevent unnecessary um, drive accident. This is the final example of the use case. So Formula One race. Um, Formula One race is the battle of the data analytics. And McLaren, one of our biggest business partner, um, achieved 25% faster race simulation with our edge computing technology. So the Formula car deployed more than 150 sensor, different sensor, and then they will keep sending any different types of the data to the edge and to the cloud. Um, and we can advise to the driver 
in the light timing like for example when when is the best timing to change the tire and when is the best timing to 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 um, do some maintenance for the um, formula one car so with these advices and with these data processing with our edge um, we have achieved 25 percent faster late simulation um, this is another example for the McLaren. McLaren also apply our wearable device solution. So um, the sensor of the T-shirts can advise uh, what is the best training for the driver to achieve um, the faster lace simulation. So that's pretty much everything I have for today. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Okay. Um. Maybe. Maybe I can have. Oh, okay. Please. Yes. Please. Ah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank. Thank you, Ken for attending the whole session. I. Uh, I just like to ask if I want to become your customer, where do I put the edge? If I want to use uh, edge computing for campus network, where do I place my edge computer? Thank you. Thank you so much for asking the question, Kanjana. Um, so um, the example and use cases I um, explained for today is for the Japan uh, the edge services provided by entity communication. So that's the um, use case for Japan market at this point of the time. But um, the whole entity limited group is now um, doing some roadmap um, to productize the edge services for the customer um, in, uh, in, in all of the world, not only limited to the Japan market. Um, so whenever we productize such services for the edge computing, uh, we will definitely let you know. But I believe we can deploy such a, um, edge computing services um, in our global global data center utilizing our um, networks as well. So, but for the detail, I will definitely come back to you to let you know. Any any other more questions? Yes, please. So uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just wondering. Um, so when you actually talk about the edge computing, right? Um, are you mean that you are actually building a compute node on the entity technology there, or are you guys are the one who provides the, the connectivity service to the on the edge um, the compute that's been provided by other cloud services? But I looked at the on the presentation there, it doesn't seem like it was actually explaining you know, clearly. Can you actually elaborate a little further on that? So thank you so much, Bayan Fan. Um, so the edge computing that I just explained for today is the, we call it STPF edge. Um, that's the um, on plate. So we provide three components for these services. One is the hardware, and another one is a virtual machine deployed on our hardware, which is going to be deployed on the customer's site. And then the controller for customer to access any different types of the apps through our edge terminal. And if customer wishes, of course, we can provide a network services on top of it. And it depends on the um, customer's demand, what types of the network they want to, they want entity to provide it. So the SDPF edge server is just the one component for our services. So we can optimize um, edge computing services all together with our network services, but customer can select what types of the network they want. Um, they want us to bundle together with 
the SPPF H topic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, another big round of applause for Mr. Fukuda and Mr. Oki from NTT Limited. Okay. Next, we go to our last speaker of this session, Mr. Chao Yin Lung from Akamai Technology. He will be giving a talk on the topic of enhancing performance of POH using CDN Edge Compute and Edge Database. And he is with us online. Stage is yours. Hi, hi, everybody. So uh, just to check, can you hear me and see the slides? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, let me begin. So uh, my topic for today is how to implement and scale a, a DNS over HTTP infrastructure. But before that, let me just introduce myself. So my name is uh, Yin Lung. I'm a technical solutions architect at Akamai, uh, specializing in uh, edge technologies. So just a summary of my talk today. So for both security and privacy reasons, we increasingly see application providers, especially mobile application providers, are increasingly using DNS over HTTP rather than your usual DO53. So application providers do that because they want to get around people hijacking their DNS, uh, DNS hijacking attempts of their applications. And hence they will use their own DOH servers. However, Scaling an infrastructure can be a difficult task. So I would like to show an uh, architecture where an edge compute system together with a data store, an edge database, can provide performance enhancement for your DNS over HTTP application. So let me just go through some of the reasons why people do this. So, a lot of our uh, customers who are mobile application providers, they face DNS hijacking attempts in their apps. So for example, if their apps have different regions and certain regions goes back to a HTTP server, their apps face hijacking attempts in certain ISPs where they are replaced by advertisements or even links where malware can be downloaded. So they face this in, in various uh, locations in the world and hence they want to stop it being uh, hijacked. So, so one of the ways is to go this uh, DNS over HTTP. They also want to avoid that their, that their data is being collected by various actors along this path about how their app works and what uh, services their app uses by looking at all their hostname resolutions. So basically, DNS over HTTP is one possible solution. However, the DNS resolver quality is very important because this has direct correlation with the consistency and the predictability of the application. For example, if the application is some gaming application, we don't want it to introduce uh, any game lag, especially upon startup. And also, we want to ensure that the, uh, the DOH, which takes control over the total customer experience, can be as performant as possible, hence the content of this talk. But before that, let us just go over a brief overview of what uh, DOH is. So DNS over HTTP is in uh, the RFC A4, A4 standard. Basically, it defines a HTTPS session for the stuck to recursive loop. So it uses TCP port 443, same like your HTTPS. So in that way, it can be hidden together with other HTTPS traffic, making it harder to filter. And most importantly, it moves the DNS res resolution to the application layer. So now it's the application provider responsibility to make sure the DNS requests are getting through. And usually most application providers will use the JSON format response for the DNS resolution because I mean, it's very consistent with how you program your APIs in your application. So some of the benefits of DOH it prevents eavesdropping by intermediaries so they can't collect data on how your app is working or what type of uh, hosting your app is resolving by your users. And also importantly, it overcome that problem of DNS hijacking. People can't replace links in your app with uh, advertisements or malware. The application to resolve a connection is encrypted and hidden inside the other web traffic as well. 
and you can embed within your mobile application your own resolver instead of depending on the OS, let's say on the Android OS uh, uh, DNS uh, settings. The mobile application also can wire its initial own remote resolver to a default resolver. And some reasons why you would use the, your own private DOH resolver rather than public one, because we don't want uh, uh, the, the, the public, we don't want information to be concentrated in a few companies, right, as public DOH resolver. And because this information will then be subjected to jurisdiction of their country which they operate in. Furthermore, if you have your own private resolver, the app provider can then mine their own data for their own usage. So let us get into an example. So a simplistic example of a way where a customer who's doing an application can set up a DOH service is by just having a single DOH server in the cloud somewhere. So they will have their mobile app client of which they would have modified the HTTP client itself to use a custom DNS interface to use DOH for all HTTP requests to API endpoints. So we will do an initial DSNS request for all the host names over HTTPS that the app requires to a single server located in the cloud. So this is a centralized DOH server and all clients, all users of the mobile application will reach out to it when it's starting up. So there are problems with this simplified implementation. First of all, it's just a single DOH server and its performance might get degraded if you get more and more users. Secondly, these, is our, these connection, DOH connections are over TCP and TLS for encrypted DNS. And TCP connections do take up some resources. So scaling it is also difficult. Thirdly, there's also the uh, security risk. So, so people who find out how which, which your IP of DDoS of your DOH server can uh, DDoS it. So that's a DDoS risk as well. So there are three possible ways to scale a DOH. So we could possibly add more capacity in one location. For example, have a cluster in the cloud with load balancing. Or we could have, add more DOH resolvers around the world. So for example, we have multiple clusters of these DOH resolvers and we have some sort of load balancing between them. Thirdly, we can add a device in front of the DOH for DOH server for HTTPS or TLS connection scaling. So this device can be like a proxy and this proxy can live within ISPs all around the world. So this is the third method which I'm going to, this third method is the method which I'm going to show you how we can accelerate the DOH architecture for a mobile application provider. So here is an example of how the accelerated DOH architecture can be. So instead of going directly to the DOH resolver, we will go towards a H server. So this H server will be close to where your client sits. And within this H server, we would have some small uh, compute resources as well as a H database for storing, uh, for, for storing state, state data. So the H compute will receive the, the DOH request and it will check within the H database whether the answers are there and whether it's still within the TTL. If it is, then it will immediately return those answers to the questions which the, uh, the, the mobile app client has uh, asked for. So it will be very performant because it doesn't need to go back to the DOH resolver somewhere in the cloud. Wait, Jojo, I just want to ask you. 我问我问佢啊，你应该冇 at 到你啊，我而家叫紧佢啊，我而家我而家叫紧佢，你俾我揿一下 ，OK， 拜、okay,。Sorry， 呃、uh, ，Yeah， I'm not sure who was that， but let me continue。So， 呃、uh, ，I was saying that the the mobile application client will make DOH with、uh, DNS request。To an H server, which is very close to it, within maybe even within the same ISP. And within this H server, we will have an H compute system that will check its distributed H database within the same H server as well, whether it has answers for that uh, question that the mobile app client asks. And if these answers are within the TTL, it can return them immediately. If the TTL expired or it doesn't have the answers, then it will go back to the DOH 
resolve a server. And then this will first perform uh, your usual uh, request. Besides that, because we have some sort of compute here, we also can put in some business logic within it. So for example, uh, different regions might have different uh, uh, TTL uh, values as well. So if you look at the sequence diagram, So this is, yeah, this, the, the initial request will go and get uh, the nearest H server first. So this is over DO53. And once it gets the nearest H server, it can perform the DOH, subsequent DOH request for all the host names that the apps require. And this will be at, at the uh, an H server that is very close to the uh, client itself. And within this H server, you will have an H compute system. This H compute system will pass the request and check within its database whether it has all the answers. If it doesn't have, it will go to the uh, DOH origin within the cloud. And, and then when it gets back the answer, it will store it in the database for the TTL and then return to the Akamai H and then return to the client itself. So we go towards the process flow now. So yeah, so this was what I explained just now. Basically, the H server is first resolved using the O53. And the next resolutions will go through the DOH server. The response is written and stored in the H database together with the TTL value. If the, on the next request, if the TTL has not expired, it will be served directly from the H server. If it is expired, it will go back to the, and the cache has been erected, it will, it will go back to the origin and get it back and served and, and stored in the H server itself. The other benefit you get if the origin DOH server is down, it can still be served from the H database within the H server. So you have uh, robustness built in as well. So the benefit of this accelerated architecture would be it's going to have large performance improvement going to the nearest H. So you have to go to some origin uh, in, in some region or from all parts of the world. It provides horizontal scaling for TCP connections. Very importantly, it has security benefits that it provides uh, DDoS protections. It enables smart resolution with business logic at the edge as well, because you have the edge compute system. So you can uh, do various things with it, right? And the example I gave is that you could have different TTL if, you, if your mobile clients are from different regions. And it provides robustness in case of failure of the DOH central server as well. And if you think about it, it also can provide other benefits that makes the app faster. So instead of just asking one question in every request, the app can now request all host name that is going to be used in the one request when it's startup, and it will receive all the answers in one response. So subsequent operations like uh, uh, storing uh, logs and all that, it doesn't need that host names anymore because a modern application right, is going to go to various host names like for uh, ads, like for storing uh, uh, data, for storing what you call uh, statistics, statistical data of the app, how fast it runs, all this, you will need different host names. So if you ask all of it upfront, and especially all the, 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 the important API host name that you need to request, it's going to get all the answers upfront, and then it will increase the performance for subsequent HTTP requests, since all the host name has already been resolved. So, so that is another nice uh, uh, benefit you get from using DOH and accelerating it using the edge. And you might ask for client-side implementation. How, how do you do it? So, so various HTTP clients like OK HTTP enables you to have a DNS over HTTPS for your DNS object. So you don't have to use the, the, the usual uh, DO53 object. So, and then there are various others as well. Or you could write your own. Yeah. So in summary, uh, mobile app providers are increasingly implementing DOH for both security, I mean, for all security reasons. And they prefer not to use public resolvers, but self DOH resolvers. So, a method which we see them use is that to increase the performance and robustness of their DOH architecture is to use an H compute and H database architecture, which can enable DOH to be set up globally with various performance, robustness, and security benefits. So uh, that is all for my talk. Thank you. And this is my email address.
So uh, mm -hmm. welcome. Any questions right now? Any questions for him? Okay, there's no question here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we have three speakers in this session from AWS NGT Limited and Akamai Technologies. And next session we have peering personnel. So in this